This video is about the presidential slash election amendments to the Constitution. Hopefully this probably isn't the first of these YouTube videos that you're watching, but if it is, you may be wondering, Mrs. Leader, why are we talking about 12, 17, 20, 22, and 25? Those are not in any particular order. Well, it actually works out really well when talking about the amendments to talk about them grouped together by subject matter. So all of the amendments that I'm going to teach you about in this video all have to do with either the office of president or elections in general. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is the 12th Amendment. The 12th Amendment was ratified in 1804, and essentially it makes some changes to the Electoral College, which was, of course, established in the Constitution. Hopefully you all remember that the Electoral College is the process by which we elect presidents here in the United States. Okay, so essentially the idea is that people go and vote and then the electors see, okay, this is what people want us to vote for and then we go and we make the final decision and then we actually cast our ballot for, um, for president. Now, up until 1804, every elector and also the voters voted for two people. OK, um, and essentially the person who got the second most votes then would be the vice president president. OK, so basically the runner up would be the vice president. OK, now it didn't take very many elections um, to realize that this was extremely problematic. OK, and the election of 1800 was a very good example of this. Um, I highly recommend to Google the election of 1800 and there is a clip on YouTube of Hamilton that has the song the election of 1800 and it gives you a good demonstration of this because essentially Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson were both running for president it was a very nasty election where they said a lot of nasty things about each other and then Jefferson wins Aaron Burr comes in second and that makes Aaron Burr the vice president and essentially Thomas Jefferson was like I don't want you to essentially help me run the country because we don't get along. We were campaigning against each other. So they write up this. Um, Thomas Jefferson um, essentially asked Congress to uh, write up this amendment. OK, so they change it to the fact that now the electors um, cast a vote for two people together. OK, so you have a running mate. So the president and the vice president run together. Um, and I just realized that I misspelled president, so I'm sorry about that. There we go. Um, and so basically now we don't have this situation where the person who gets the second most votes is the vice president. You, those votes are always cast together, okay? So you will see when you go to um, vote and you look at the ballot, you um, on the last election you would have seen Trump and Pence together and Clinton and Kane together because Mike Pence um, was the running mate of Donald Trump and Tim Kane was the running mate of Hillary Clinton. Okay, so they were both, so you're still casting two votes, but you're casting them together so that we don't have this whole runner up as the VP situation. Okay, so that's the 12th Amendment. Now, the 17th Amendment. Um, is uh came about um in 1913 okay so it was a ratified in 1913 and essentially this is the direct election of senators prior to this amendment in 1913 all united states senators were chosen by the state legislatures in that respective state so for example the two senators from ohio were selected by the ohio general assembly and this was problematic for a few reasons. I mean, essentially only political insiders were chosen, okay? Um, and anybody who everybody in their legislature really liked, obviously whoever the controlling political party was or whoever had the most power in the legislature, that's who um, would be nominated. And you can actually see in this little cartoon, if you look really closely, it says, insert a million dollars to get your, <laughs> um, to become a senator, essentially is what it says. Um, and then down here, this says state legislature. So you can see that essentially they're saying that if you 
paid enough money to the late state legislature, you know, you could be a lobbyist, you could be whatever, then they're going to like you and then they're going to appoint you to the U.S. Senate. OK. And so obviously there were a lot of people who had problems with this. OK. Um, and so then we have this amendment that now it's just you go to the ballot every six years and you vote. Um, for senators. Okay, so now they're elected by people. Okay, elected by the voters. Um, it also, the amendment also sets up for a situation that if the spot was vacated before the election, um, it gives governors the, the um, it gives them the power to appoint someone um, and either they serve the rest of the term or they hold a special election. Um, it actually kind of lets the state legislatures decide that, but Typically, a governor will always appoint someone, and then usually they also have a special election later, okay? Um, but this does happen a fair amount. Uh, most recently, um, John McCain unfortunately died. He was a sitting senator at the time, and so someone had to, you know, take over for him until his term was up. Um, and often, sometimes people will step down to go run for another office as well, okay? Um, so that's the 17th Amendment. The 20th Amendment, ratified in 1933, essentially just sets the start dates for Congress and the president, okay? So up until 1933, the president actually was not sworn in and didn't start their term until like March. So they had almost a six month period between when the president was elected and when they actually took office. And mostly that was because at the dawn of the country, they actually needed six months to get prepared because they had to, you know, pack, they had to move probably really far away. Travel was very difficult because it was all by horse and buggy. Um, there was no telegraph or anything yet. So communication took forever because everything had to be done by mail and like mail was delivered by a horse. Um, and so, um, but by 1933, we have trains, we have telephones, we have telegraphs. And so everything moves faster and we don't need six months. Okay. So, um, they moved the start date up to January 20th, and it has been the same ever since, okay? Um, Congress starts a little bit earlier, January 3rd, um, and, then Con and then the president starts a few weeks later, okay? Um, it also sets this January 3rd date as the start of the new session of Congress each year. Um, essentially, Congress has a new session every year, and they have a new number. Um, I believe the one that is starting this January is 116th Congress, I believe. Okay, so that is the 20th Amendment. <clears throat> the 22nd Amendment, ratified in 1951, establishes term limits for the president. Okay, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, we have a picture of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the 32nd president of the United States. And he served as president before this amendment was in place, and he is essentially the reason for the amendment. He was actually elected to four terms. He died very shortly into that fourth term, so he really only served three, but he actually was elected to four. <coughs> Sorry. And so essentially, after he was elected, um, or after he had died in office, people realized that, you know, this wasn't a great idea. You know, we realized that someone could get elected over and over again, and maybe that wasn't super democratic. So the 22nd Amendment is drafted and ratified by enough states, and it establishes the term limits for president. You can have two consecutive terms, um, and it also says that if a vice president takes over for um, a president's term, if they serve more than two years of it, then it's technically their term, and that counts towards that consecutive term thing. So essentially, you could have a situation where a person serves almost 10 years instead of eight, because if you serve just under two years of another president's term, like let's say they die in office, um, then you could still get elected to two terms of your own. But if you were over the two-year mark, one of those would count and you would only get to run for one other term of your own, okay? The other president I have pictured here is Grover Cleveland, and I just think he's a fun case to talk about because he's the only president in history who has served non-consecutive terms. So he was actually the 22nd and the 24th president, so there was a president in between him. Um, so he actually could have served three because he could have served again later, 
Um, so you could actually have a situation where if somebody were young enough and popular enough, they could serve two terms, set out one, then run again and serve like another two. Um, but, you know, typically people are too old for that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and very often once somebody's out, then they're not as popular anymore. So, okay. Last amendment, the 25th, passed in, ratified in 1967. Okay, so this essentially just kind of reaffirms the line of succession. The line of succession was actually written in a law by Congress and it establishes there's like a row of like, I think 13 or 15 different positions that will take over in the event that something happens to the president and all and a lot of other cabinet members at once. But essentially it says the line of succession is the vice president becomes president, then the speaker of the house would be next in line if they're both gone. The president pro tem, that's what PPT stands for, um, is next in line and then the secretary of state and then after that it's the order of which the other cabinets were established, okay? But for you to get that far down the line, like all of those other people have to be dead essentially. Um, and that has never happened. We've had lots of vice presidents take over for presidents, but nobody other farther down than that. However, before this amendment, we did have a situation where um, once the once the vice president took over, nobody really knew, like, what do we do about this empty office of vice president? There were actually a lot of times in history where there just wasn't one because it wasn't a really very important position. Um, but now that the office of vice president is more important, we feel um, the government um, felt like we needed to have a very clear kind of establishment for that. So essentially, this amendment says that if the vice president takes over for the president, then they appoint someone as the new vice president, okay? That actually had happened when um, President Nixon resigned, then Gerald Ford actually stepped in and became president, and then he got to um, appoint someone. And another fun fact about President Gerald Ford, he is the only president who was not elected um, because um, Res President Nixon's uh, previous vice president who was in there before Gerald Ford actually had to resign as well. Spiro Agnew was his name. He had a whole totally different um, scandal than Watergate and he had to resign and then Nixon had to resign and so Gerald Ford was not elected because he was appointed by President Ford then he himself stepped down and then Ford took over. OK, um, <clears throat> it also sets up a process for the president to transfer power to the vice president for possibly like a short amount of time. So let's say, for instance, the president had a stroke and they were totally incapacitated. The vice president um, and the majority of the cabinet could go to Congress and say, look, this thing happened to the president you need to transfer power to me for this time being, okay? And then Congress with a two thirds vote would have to agree to that. And then for that amount of time, the vice president would be running the country while the president got better, okay? One of the issues with this amendment is just that they don't, the amendment does not specify what they mean by inability to serve, okay? So that can be really up for debate as to what it means to be inability to serve, okay? Um, but essentially it does give, it does give, uh, it does put a process out there for um, making sure that the country always has a very qualified leader. Because um, there actually have been a lot of times in history where presidents have had strokes or different medical issues. And actually they just kept it secret from everybody and power was never transferred to the vice president. But now that we live in the age of nuclear weapons, um, it's much more important for that to not happen um, and to make sure that we always have a very clear-headed person running the country. All right, if you have any questions about these amendments, please reach out to your government teacher.